Good evening everyone and welcome to today's wonderful evening. Ram Sundaram Tahira Jennifer Vivek Vivek Raj Lot of posts in uh, Inkas Dot Life. Thank you for all that. Take an active participation to post some notes, etc., in the Incas.live, which is the community for all of you. Joy the Patacharya, Tahira, and many more who are all online. So please inform your classmates that the live class has started in all the Yes, so we had been laboring with, uh, we had been laboring with obstetrics, their ecology. This entire week, this is the third week in our schedule, we will further labor to know what are the other favorite topics, issues, concepts that the examiner is going to test in this subject called obstetrics and gynecology. Oh my God. OBG, the name used to terrorize us when we were preparing for entrance exam. But it's a very interesting, easily achievable subject if you are sure about some of the common concepts, right? So let's make the great beginning doctor. Visaiko vaginal fistulas. Uritero vaginal fistula. Recto vaginal fistula. Recto urethral fistula. Etc. etc. Now let us look into it.
Yeah. Sorry, guys. There was a sudden power shutdown, and internet uh, goes off. And once more to reload, it will take five minutes of time. So sorry for that. But uh, once more the during our session, once more the power is supposed to. When it comes back, also the internet get disconnected. So that is the reason. One more time, I may, I may go out of uh, broadcast. But please wait five minutes. Once more, I'll be coming back. Yeah. So few challenges to deliver it. Deliver a lecture. Yeah. So, uh, once more, sorry, I went uh, out of uh, the stream. Yes. Now, let's make the great beginning and pray Lord Ganesha that uh, once more the power doesn't go away in the home. Am I audible to everybody? Can you please punch? into the chat window. So doctor, the most appropriate method for collecting the urine for the culture in case of vesico-vaginal fistula. Very good. Basically it is by Foley's catheter. A case of obstructed labor has delivered by cesarean section so obstructed labor is a one of the very important risk factor for the obstetrical fistulas, gynecological fistulas. So 
cyclical passage of the menstrual blood into the urine. So that means the urine comes through urethra, stored in bladder. Menstrual blood is there in uterus and it is also there in vagina and cervix. So that is the reason there should be some connection connecting the two. So it is the visico uterine fistula which is the most important complication of the obstructed labor that can lead to cyclical passage of the menstrual blood in the urine is what you need to remember. So now let's quickly have 10 points about the various fistulas. Any abnormal communication between urinary and genital organs. There are two golden rules in fistulas. First rule, the urine will escape from the ureter, from the ureter and it can enter into the tube or uterus or cervix or vagina. Any of these with the fistula to the ureter can lead to the development of the, uh, can have a connection. Then bladder, a bladder can connect with the tube, uterus, cervix or vagina. But urethra, whenever it forms fistula, the fistula will only be to the vagina. So from the bladder comes the urethra. From the uterus comes the vagina. So urethra and vagina only can connect. Urethra cannot connect with uh, the uterus directly or cervix directly or to the tube directly. Whereas ureter and bladder can connect with tube or uterus or cervix or to the vagina is what you have to fundamentally appreciate. Then the second important rule is in the naming of the fistula. Part of the urinary tract is first described. So typically it is a trend, um, tradition to call it as visico vaginal fistula, not vagino visical. So urinary tract is first, then genital tract next. So typically you have the bladder leaving into urethra. You have the uterus forming the cervix leaving into vagina. So vagina and the urethra, they both can connect with each other. They can both form a connection. That is the bladder can form a connection with vagina. It can form a connection with cervix or to the uterus or even to the tube. Any of them can get connected. So according to you how visicovaginal, ureterovaginal, urethrovaginal, visicocervical, ureterocervical, ureteroutrine fistula are the various varieties of the fistula is what you have to emphatically remember. So, if you take the various fistulas, commonest type of fistula, this is a favorite MCQ. The psycho vaginal fistula is the commonest of all the fistulas, is what you should remember. So, what lead to these fistulas? It can be congenital very rarely, traumatic, commonly obstetric. It can be a necrotic obstetrical fistula or a traumatic obstetrical fistula. Any surgery while you are operating on the pelvic organs can lead to a surgical trauma, direct trauma, inflammatory diseases, malignant neoplasms, and any radium, if you use as an intracavitary brachiotherapy, can lead to the development of the fistula. So, necrotic obstetrical fistula. 
any prolonged compression of the soft tissues between the fetal head and the brim of a narrow pelvis and the brim of a narrow pelvis it will lead to ischemia pressure necrosis and sloughing of the base of the bladder urethra is also involved very often and incontinence when will it develop if there is any obstetrical fistula five to seven days this is an mcq after the labor it can lead to development of incontinence is what you need to remember now trauma can oxidation can lead to a trauma yes sir direct injury to the bladder wall by a sharp instrument like a perforator or a decapitation hook when you are uh, delivering a dead fetus it can lead to the development of traumatic obstetrical fistula forceps does not lead to traumatic obstetrical fistula that commonly but incontinence will appear immediately after the labor if it is traumatic it takes five to seven days after the labor if it is necrotic Ames, PJ, Chipper, any damn entrance you go, this is the favorite issue for the examiner. It is five to seven days after labor, which is immediately after labor, based on the etiology. Now, there can be a surgical trauma, the bladder may be injured, especially if you are doing anterior calporacy. Yesterday we have discussed a prolapse. You are all there in the class, right? Prolapse. So during vaginal operation, like anterior calporaphy, there can be injury to the bladder. Similarly, abdominal operations like hysterectomy, there can be injury to the bladder. So that's a traumatic fistulas. Similarly, any inflammatory disease involving the bladder, like bilharziasis, tuberculosis, any pelvic abscess that means opening into bladder or vagina, any malignant neoplasm or radium necrosis, anything can lead to the fistulas is what you need to remember. So what are the symptoms? There can be a large fistula or a partial, smaller, high fistula. There can be symptoms of vulvitis, cystitis, and there will be a history of incontinence following the labor. It is several days after the labor if it is necrotic and it is immediately after the labor if it is traumatic. Is what you need to remember. So, in the sims position, left lateral semi-prone position, you use the sims speculum in order to inspect the anterior vaginal wall in order to detect the uh, fistula. So you all know that the bladder, urethra, anteriorly, uterus and cervix and vagina. So you, with the sims speculum, look for any fistula in the anterior vaginal wall. That is very, very important. Similarly, you can use methylene blue is the dye, which is passed in the bladder using a catheter. So that it will let you know where is the fistula. We will take up the methylene blue test. And even a uterine sound can be passed through the urethra to identify the fistulas opening. Now how do you manage the fistulas? Typically, you need to identify Antinatally only, you need to identify the abnormalities that can result in fistula, like a contracted pelvis or malpresentations. And you need to manage them. So that is antenatal prophylaxis. And during the labor, you should properly diagnose a prolonged labor, contracted pelvis, malpresentation, any of them can predispose to the development of obstetrical fistula. And you need to be careful to avoid the risky surgeries like high forceps.
forceps with incompletely dilated cervix, risky destructive operations, etc., etc. And uh, if you find the injury to the bladder during a difficult labor, how do you want to manage it? This is another favorite MCQ of examiner. During labor, there is an injury to the bladder which has been discovered. What do you want to do? Don't suture the tear because all that tissue is edematous, very friable. You should not apply suture. You fix a rubber catheter for 10 days and the tear will heal completely. That is an important principle. But if the injury is detected sometime after the labor, typically it happens in the case of the necrotic fistulas. Operation should be done at least three months after the delivery. This is a very important MCQ in case of bladder injury discovered after labor, during labor. When do you want to repair? How do you want to manage? Definitely animal MCQ head. Now you are very sure about it. So pre-operatively you need to treat the vulvitis, check the renal function test, culture the urine. And very important is methylene blue test. It's a very interesting uh, image based MCQ in the exam. So what is the main purpose of methylene blue test? Bladder to vagina versus ureter to vagina. Yaha bladder hai. Bladder se kya nikalta? Urethra. Bladder ke andar kaun aata? Ureter. Ureter comes to bladder. Bladder leaves into urethra. Very good. Then there is a uterus. There is a cervix. There is a vagina. So visaiko that is from bladder to the vagina, is it the fistula? Or is it from the ureter to the vagina? Is it the fistula? Uh, that is the methylene blue test. Kushi Kashya, where will I find the Esther Day video? Doctor, yesterday video is archived every day after the live broadcast is over, we remove the video. <clears throat> we are not the holy people as what we look like. We are definitely commercial guys, no doubt about it. So I want to tell you, Kasha, that uh, I will quickly show you. Uh, yeah, I'll quickly show you where on our uh, uh, where are the everyday videos after the live broadcast? Where are they available? I'm going to show you. Right, so. You need to visit, you need to visit online mbbs.com doctor, www.online mbbs.com. You can give a call to this number 9008683356. If you come down here, you get view all courses. In the view all courses, we have this course in the bottom called Top Need PG 2021 FMGE with 250 hours live classes. So once you come to this, here there is a schedule. June 1st to 6th, 8th to 13th, 15th to 20th, gynecology obstetrics. Around 700 to 800 questions we will discuss. Then two weeks surgery, two weeks SPM, one week pediatrics, one week anatomy, like that, there is a schedule. Live online classes. So after the session is over, they remove that. They will 
cut the video into topic wise and from June 1 to June 6 first week all the videos are made available over here then in the second week whatever the videos are there they are all made available over here agree then in the third week what are the videos are there they will be made available over here so like that after this session is over we remove the video and then we post it here along with the powerpoint and please take a chance to subscribe the video library and uh, also help us to sustain this organization because there are a lot of employees who work with us and uh, uh, they will all they all because of this organization is not there but because we have a passion to teach without students there is no fun we want to have a large number of students that is our greediness that's the reason we freely live broadcast into the youtube but at the same time we archive all this content into the online mbbs.com and uh, every day you we will sit together and study together so that most of the concepts 953 topics that the examiner is going to test you are going to finish in the next 25 weeks in a total duration of about 250 hours you don't need anything else to become a topper than to meticulously be part of this live online interactive session okay doctor so there's a reason Kushi Kashyap, please take a chance to subscribe to the online MBBS.com. Now, Doctor, let us come back to our story. Methylene blue test. So, three pieces of the gauze, one, two, three, three pieces of the gauze are placed in the vagina and you take 200 cc of methylene blue and through the foley you pass it into the bladder. Now, the lowest piece of the gauze is discarded because the lowest piece often gets stained because there can be a little slipping of the dye while you are uploading. Now, if the middle or upper piece is stained, suppose if the middle or upper piece stain, so when will middle or upper piece will stain? If there is a fistula coming from bladder. If none of the pieces stain and upper one is wet with uncolored urine, none of them are staining with the methylene blue which is there in the bladder, but the upper one is wet. It is not stained, but it is wet. That means the ureter, which is bringing the urine into the bladder, directly made a connection with the vagina. So that means it is a ureteric urethro vaginal fistula if all are dry and they are not stained two conclusions it is neither a vesical fistula nor a ureteric fistula is what you have to appreciate but how do you make a definitive diagnosis cystoscopy will help you it will enable you to know the relation of the fistula to the ureteric co-openings in the bladder. It will exclude multiple fistulas. Any bladder pathology, they are identified on cystoscopy. And you can even inject indigo carmine lotion solution. That's called chromocystoscopy. So how do you manage the fistulas? There is a flap splitting operation or otherwise called de-doublement. 
So this is the fistulous opening. You make a subtler incision, long incision, and there is a free mobilization of the vaginal flaps on the bladder or a wide area, at least 1.5 centimeters around the fistula. So it's called flap splitting operation. So the whole idea is to close that opening, abnormal opening, right? Now, saucerization operation, it is also called sinks operation. If the tissues have too adherent fibrosed, so that you can't do the flap splitting, if there are, if the fistula which is opening is too adherent, or if there is any failure of flap splitting, then you do the saucerization. The edges of the fistula are excised, removing a wide part of the vagina. Then you will also excise mus muscular wall of the bladder. Edges of the both organs are coapted together with a non-absorbable suture, just called saucerization. Another way to manage the fistula is what you need to remember. Now, post-operatively, you have to give a lot of fluids, urinary antiseptics, vaginal pack is removed 24 hours after operation and you retain the catheter and removed after 10 days. So, there are all the post-operative care instructions. And after repairing, you should tell the patient to avoid sexual intercourse for 3 months and avoid pregnancy for 1 year. And any fistula repair following that, if there is a pregnancy, it is an absolute indication for doing the cesarean. No more vaginal delivery attempts. Now, if ureter directly connects to the vagina, ureter or vaginal fistula, so when does it happen? Hysterectomy. Very common reason for ureterovaginal fistula or any difficult labor. It leads to incomplete incontinence and uh, methylene blue tags will try to differentiate visicovaginal from ureterovaginal fistula. And uh, how can you avoid ureteric injury? That's very important. Preoperatively, do IV pyelography, do ureteric catheterization. And use a proper surgical technique while doing procedure like hysterectomy. There are all the prophylactic measures is what you need to remember. Very good, Kashyap. Thanks for uh, telling me that you are already subscribed. Excellent. Very good, doctor. Very good. Now, a <clears throat> lot of students have requested. Sir, up YouTube is sub jano ke saath batate hai what is the strategy of preparation. But har ek student ka apne personal problems rehte, right? Some student is very good in anatomy, some good student is not good in certain topics. Some student is worried about how to remember numericals. Everyone has their own specific personalized challenges. So what I thought is teaching is okay. But I also love to be a mentor. And uh, we will have a one to one video consultation, right? I'll be your strategy consultant for fighting the war. Right, so uh, I will listen to you. How was your entire medical school? What topics you read well? How do we both go about? What is the current stage of preparation, etc.? So I give a fifteen-minute video consultation. So. Shortly, we will open it up. You can be able to book for a 15 minute consultation for strategy and appoint me as your strategic consultant. Like uh, Chanikya was appointed as uh, a strategy consultant.
for the Chandragupta to fight the war, right? So, uh, and uh, that's the plan. So, doctor, because most important thing is we should know what we are good at, where we need to improve, how to get a focus in preparation, and how to approach within the short limited time available. So I'm going to give this strategy consultations, 15 minute video call, one to one on the Zoom. So one to one personal call. So to help you, to handhold you, to guide you into the right path of winning. Okay. Now, doctor, if the ureteral vaginal fistula is there, what do you need to do? You need to take back the ureter and put it back to the bladder. So abdominal re-implantation of the ureter should be done. If it is not possible, ureter is transplanted into sigmoid colon. Right? So it's called as ureterosigmoidostomy. It is one of the important causes for the metabolic acidosis. So now, what are the types of incontinence of urine? True incontinence. Genito urinary fistulas are all true incontinence. Stress incontinence, that is weakness of internal urethral sphincter, is called stress urinary incontinence. And there is a excessive activity of the bladder, which is called urge incontinence. And there is a false incontinence, that is, there is a atonic bladder and all the urine got retained in it and after some time there is an overflow, false incontinence. So there are the different types of incontinence. Then what is the cause of retention of the urine? It is an impacted pelvic mass. It can be a retroverted gravid uterus that can lead to the impaction leading to urinary retention. And uh, diagnosis is made clear by attention to all those associated symptoms. What led to that gives you a clue, like a Pandora box, about the cause of the retention of the urine. Now, doctor, in this context, I want to draw your attention to one very important uh, uh, piece once more. Um, I really appreciate uh, um, one of our students on the Incas dot life. I hope you all know and you're all part of this Incas dot life. Every day new new members are joining and they're also contributing and I want also you to contribute. So I like Vivek because Vivek is one of the active member of uh, our Incas.life community. So you see all the quick summary about mitral stenosis. Give a big clap to Vivek. Then uh, one of the students has posted. Uh, one of the students, Dolly. Dolly has posted. Urinary bladder, internal sphincter. How is the parasympathetic and sympathetic innervation? I really like it. So, urinary bladder and the internal, I'm talking from Incas not live. You have all these images and uh, there are, on every subject, there are about 1500 MCQs posted in the groups. You can always uh, play with the key and also add some comments 
and engage yourself and you can make friends with others. So urinary bladder plus internal sphincter, both sympathetic, parasympathetic of autonomic nervous system. Whereas external sphincter is only by somatic. Beautiful. Sympathetic is called the nerve of filling. Nerve of filling. This is one of the uh, challenging topics for a lot of students. And a nice handwritten uh, illustration and uploaded into Incas.live by Dr. Vivek. Thousand thanks to you, right? That's the spirit of preparation. When we all work together, collective intelligence it is called. So T10, L1, L2 is sympathetic. So this is how the sympathetic chain comes down. Even if it is sympathetic, the preganglionic fibers are cholinergic. Beautiful point. There is the hypogastric ganglion. And from here, there is alpha and beta adrenergic fibers. So the hypogastric nerve will be carrying the alpha adrenergic fibers. And uh, the other is beta adrenergic fibers will come in inner way. But beta adrenergic innervates the bladder muscle. Alpha adrenergic will go and innervate the internal sphincter. Very important. Beautiful illustration, Vivek. I'm very proud of you for being a good contributor on the Incas.life. Now, Parasympathetic is called nerve of emptying. Agar parasympathetic bole to, bladder will undergo contraction and passes the urine. Called nerve of emptying. S2, S3, S4 is the root value of the parasympathetic. And typically, pelvic nerve called nervi erigentis is the one which basically carries the fibers. And it supplies both internal sphincter and also the bladder. Now, the external urethral sphincter is being supplied by the pudendal nerve. Pudendal nerve. So, what is the root value of pudendal nerve? The root value of pudendal nerve is S2, S3, and S4. It is somatic. And it is the one which brings all that voluntary control is what you should remember. So this is the beautiful summary. Vivek, you are Professor Vivek from today. Sympathetic, parasympathetic, somatic. What is the action on detrusor? Sympathetic will cause relaxation, parasympathetic contraction and no effect by the somatic. Then internal sphincter, sympathetic will cause contraction, parasympathetic lead to relaxation. And on the external urethral sphincter, somatic will cause contraction. That is the beauty of Incas.live. www.incas.live. So, gentlemen, I invite you all, ladies and gentlemen, I invite you all to be part of Incas.live and uh, yesterday Prasoon has added very good quick summary of the cataract. So this is how we all should uh, contribute to each other to study together every day. A little we contribute. There's no need of uh, special coaching, special commercial programs, face-to-face -face classes, Delhi Jana, Bombay Jana, Delhi. Chennai Jana, yes, a bagnaka jirat nahi hai, hum sab milke padai karenge. Incas not like. Today only please take a chance to subscribe freely on uh, Incas not live. Now, doctor. Yes. Patients of rectovaginal fistulas, how should they be treated? They should be treated with colostrum. 
because all colon sigmoid colon is ending in rectum so if this rectum is forming a fistula with the bladder you need to treat it by colostomy a 52 year old lady presents with a constant leakage of the urine and dysuria two weeks after a complicated hysterectomy visicovaginal fistula is suspected what is a very important test for the diagnosis triple swab test triple swab test is the one which is basically done a 52 year old lady with visicovaginal fistula after abdominal hysterectomy she is not responding to conservative management what is the most important next investigation cystoscopy cystoscopy right then comes the Bartholin cyst how do you treat Bartholin cyst marsupialization you should remember Australia kangaroos marsupials so here you can see a Bartholin's duct has been blocked and distended with a large cyst in the lower third of the duct which is called Bartholin's abscess this is the left labia majora this is the vaginal orifice and this is the right labia majora and here you are able to see the presence of the Bartholin's abscess is what I want to underscore to all of you here vagina is horizontal not vertical horizontal right so now these are the Bartholin's glands the typical location this is the urethral opening this is the vaginal opening the prepuce and the cyst typically forms like this in the lower part and any abscess will typically look like this the Bartholin's abscess so clinically when you examine tomorrow examiner is going to give you the Bartholin's abscess and ask you to make the diagnosis you have to be emphatically sure so this is how marsupialization of the Bartholin sapsis and the drainage you need to appreciate now Gartner's cyst where is it located androlateral vaginal wall is the classical location non-tender swelling in the introitus once more marsupialization is considered to be the treatment a cystic swelling in the lower one third and upper two thirds of the anterior wall of the vagina at 10 o'clock position that is Gartner's cyst so typically is the bladder and this is the vagina and uh, the cotton cyst so now the next topic is breast carcinoma <coughs> So if you take the last uh, 15 years of question papers in all India, AIMS, PGI, JIPMA, FMG, DNB, whatever you do, ultimately any teacher will say the same thing or any topper will say the same thing. All 30,000 questions logically revision karna hai at least ek martaba one time that is the need of your right now selective estrogen receptor modulators what are they they are agonistic to estrogen at some location and antagonistic in some other location so all the beneficial estrogenic effects to produce those beneficial effects on the bone and the liver and to prevent the harmful estrogenic effects by being anti-estrogenic on the breast clonifene, tamoxifene, deloxifene, teremephine and uh, 
or meloxifene. They are all considered to be the list of selective estrogen receptor modulators. So in some locations they are agonistic, some locations they are antagonistic. Now this is one table, you have to be very sure of it. What is the effect of estrogen? It decreases heart flashes, it increases uterine bleeding by causing endometrial proliferation. Risk of endometrial carcinoma it will increase and it prevents postmenopausal bone loss if estrogen is there. And there is a risk of breast cancer and it has a favorable effect on serum lipids. That's the reason women are less vulnerable to develop heart attack, right? So, tamoxifene, teremifene, reloxifene, in comparison to estrogen, a table henna doctor, take a football, lelo, or man may yarnako, definitely animal acquisition. So a selective estrogen receptor modulator, it acts on the estrogen receptor in the breast cell and the breast receptor is not activated, no breast proliferation, it is anti-estrogenic on the breast. Whereas it acts on the estrogen receptor in the uterine cell, endometrium and that causes the endometrial proliferation to happen. So the most common cancer in pregnancy, any day breast cancer. About tamoxifen, it is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. It is a competitive inhibitor of the estrogen and receptor cell. And it can be used to induce the ovulation and just like estrogen, even tamoxifen increases the risk, increases the risk of venous thromboembolism is what you need to remember. All of our initial topics, you remember, there are about 15 questions, 20 questions asked. By the time we are reaching the end part, each topic may only 3, 4, 3, 4 questions push up. Right? So that's the reason we will try to run through the questions unless a lot of discussion is required. <clears throat> a woman presents with thick, curvy, white vaginal discharge on the phone only, you will tell why this is candiasis becomes over. A vaginal pH of 4, which is acidic, is associated with candle vaginitis. The most common genital infection, candida. A young sexually active female has a intense phrenitis, watery discharge. Then what do you expect this smear to show? Phrenitis is an important clue. Uh, so that is the reason Canada is the one which you have to pick up. Now comes the incontinence. The topic incontinence itself, the concepts are very incontinent. So try to learn very continent way that you don't lose it, right? The recommended non-surgical treatment of stress incontinence. Left, right, attention, standard ease. Left, right, left, right, pelvic floor, muscle exercises. They are the non-surgical treatment that strengthen the pelvic muscle floor. Pelvic floor muscles is what you need to remember. So, but yeah. Incontinence, passing urine, do taraf ka hota hai. Ek urethral hota hai aur ek extra urethral. So you all know that leaves out as urethral. Uterus leaves out as cervix and vagina. Bladder ke piche kya hai? Uterus of vagina. So, Incontinence can be urethral or it can be extra urethral. So you should know how to differentiate. So urethral 
Genine stress incontinence, retrosar instability, retention with overflow, or it can be congenital like epispedias. Detrosar instability can be neuropathic, non neuropathic, and extra urethral can be congenital with an ectopic ureter and bladder exotrophy, or it can be a fistula like a ureteric fistula, vesicle fistula, urethral fistula, etc. 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 So, what are the options for the non surgical treatment, behavioral therapy, devices, medications, etc.? But non-surgical are less invasive, but cure rate is low. And every everything depends on the patient's compliance. So this is the favorite MCQ in the tomorrow's need PG exam, doctor. First line, second line, third line treatment of the stress urinary incontinence. Gauranga Pramanek, most welcome. Latest, but late, but latest. Pelvic floor muscle training, biofeedback plus lifestyle intervention. First line. And if in case of organ prolapse, then you consider surgery. Second line treatment, venereal cones, bladder retraining, duloxetine, and in selected patients, intraurethral devices. Third line surgery, it should be minimally invasive like the transvaginal tapes or slings etc. They are the third line treatment. So this is the way you manage a multiparous woman, elderly woman presenting to you with stress incontinence. So I leave the literature for you. The typical flowchart. Now, a woman presents in gynecology OPD with history of stress incontinence. If it is a genine stress incontinence, how do you want to treat? Tension free vaginal taping, TVT. So, uterus become urethrine vagina, bladder becomes urethra. So, a polypropylene tape is positioned in the mid urethra so that the urethrovesical angle loss of the angle is responsible for all that incontinence. You have to restore that urethrovesical angle. So, this is how a transvaginal tape, transvaginal tape is being applied. Incontinence of the urine is a feature of ureterovaginal fistula. So, whenever you are suspecting vesicovaginal fistula, what is the protocol? Take the history, take, do physical exam, do the dye test. If the VVF is found, do cystoscopy, plus or minus biopsy. You evaluate the upper tract for any concomitant ureteral injury and repair the VVF and also ureteral repair. If there is no ureteral injury, only VVF repair. So you have done history, physical, dye test. If VVF is not find, found, then you do voiding cystourethrogram. Still VVF not found, do upper tract evaluation to discover ureterovaginal fistula. If it is there, try to do the repair. So this is the typical algorithm to approach the vesicovaginal fistula. So examiner, you see point ke upar jara idhar udhar idhar udhar like public prosecutor. Idhar udhar guma ke guma ke puchega. But if you are good in the algorithm, you will answer. You will crack the question, right? Bonnie's test is used to determine what? Stress urinary incontinence. So what is Bonnie's test? Fundamentally all stress urinary incontinence is due to what doctor? The bladder and ureter. Ureterovesical angle 
alteration is responsible. So, if you elevate the neck of the bladder and the leakage of the urine is stopping, that means there is a good prognosis if you repair this. That is called Boni's test. So, what is Marshall's test? The vagina in the bladder neck is infiltrated with a local anesthetic and the area is elevated with an open Alice gland. So everything is to test whether the patient will recover or not. So fundamentally the whole problem of the stress incontinence is the weakness of pelvic floor muscles. The pelvic floor sags, it does not uh, support the bladder and the bladder neck prolapses through the pelvic floor. And whenever coughing, laughing, etc. is there, then the pelvic floor fails to contract and the urethra does not tighten and that lead to passage of the urine, which is the underlying cause of stress incontinence. So to do the body stress without emptying the bladder, you have to place two fingers on each side of the urethra and exert the upward pressure against the subcubic angle and the patient is requested. Please cough, cough, cough. If no urine escapes, operative correction is okay. You can go ahead. But it is not recommended by NICE. NICE is a body that gives recommendations. Body test is not much recommended. Now, doctor. What is the most sensitive test? Iron folate is the next favorite topic of the examiner. Everything about it. What is the most sensitive test for the detection of the iron depletion in pregnancy? Any day, ferritin is sensitive for iron deficiency. 37 year old, multipara, construction labor, has hypochromic anisocytosis. In India, both iron folate combined deficiency is very, 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 very common. What is the first sign of recovery if you start with iron therapy? Reticulocytosis. So when you start folate in pregnancy, in fact, before conception only, four weeks before conception only you should start. Now comes the most interesting topic in the world. John Dees in pregnancy. Everything, anything about John Dees in pregnancy. A pregnant woman developed idiopathic cholestatic jaundice. So, what is it associated? Intense itching. Because cholestasis also lead to increase in bile salts, bile salts lead to pruritus. SGOT, SGPT is less than 60 and markedly elevated alkaline phosphatase, which is the sign of cholestasis, is what you need to remember. So, what are the causes of jaundice during pregnancy? Let us become champion in this topic, Doctor. There are some conditions which are very unique to pregnancy. Acute fatty liver of pregnancy, intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, Kali pregnant women may pregnancy ka cholestasis aata hai. Pre eclampsia, eclampsia, HLLP syndrome, hypermesis, gravidarum, they are all unique to pregnancy. Coincidentally, virus, virus, hemolytic jaundice, cholelithiasis, drug induced and obstructive jaundice, they also can lead to the development of Jaundice in pregnancy. Achha bhaiya, jaundice bolne ke liye kitna bilirubin hona chahiye. Clinically, jaundice become detected the moment the bilirubin is 2 milligram per centile. Normally is 0.2 to 0.8. Now what is the normal physiology of the liver in pregnancy? Typically, liver receives up to 25 to 35 percent of cardiac output, doctor. And even with pregnancy, this proportion of the cardiac output does not change. 
the size of the liver does not increase because of pregnancy but there is a posterior superior displacement of the liver because of the enlargement of the uterus and uh, any palpable enlargement of the uterus is considered to be abnormal in case of the pregnancy what abnormality do you think metabolic synthetic excretory functions of the liver are affected by increased levels of the progesterone in pregnancy normally only the synthetic excretory function metabolic they are all affected by the increased levels of the estrogen increased levels of progesterone in pregnancy so let us look at the lft this is the gold mine topic doctor ek food wale lo ek screenshot le lo definitely aane wala question bilirubin it is unchanged in fact sometimes slightly decreased in pregnancy ast unchanged initially but 25% decreased by third trimester alanine transaminase alt unchanged initially but 25% decreased by third trimester ggt is unchanged or only slightly decreased alkaline phosphate is alkaline phosphate is is produced by placenta that's the reason Two to four fold increase in third trimester. Cholesterol in pregnancy increases two fold. Triglycerides increase two to three fold. Globulin will increase in alpha and also beta. Globulin is what you need to remember. So any elevated maternal unconjugated bilirubin, it does not have a deleterious effect on the neurodevelopmental. Status of the offspring. If the mother has hyperbilirubinemia, uh, unconjugated bilirubin do not have any deleterious effect. Now, what are the main causes in pregnancy? As we have said, unique to pregnancy: intrahepatic cholestasis, acute fatty liver, HLLP, and hyperemesis gravidarum. And some are coincident. Now, intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy may ke baare mein. पांच पंक्तियों में जवाब दे दो कल के रीड पीजे में पूछेगा फाइव पॉइंट वन पॉइंट टू फोर परसेंट ऑफ ऑल प्रेगनेंसी शो ऑप्शन इक्वल स्टेजेस सिवियर इच्छी सिवियर प्लूराइटिस थर्ड टाइम मिस्टर प्लीज डोंट फंगे एग्जाम में बिल आस्क यू फर्स्ट टाइम्स तू सेकंड टाइम्स तू थर्ड टाइम्स तू व्हेन विल यू एक्सपेक्ट There will be malaise. There is insomnia. There is dark urine, anorexia, steatorrhea. All cholestatic features. So, increased bile acids, moderate elevation of ALT, alkaline phosphate is rise in razor bilirubin and gum glutamyl transferase is fortunate to remember. So, what are the maternal risks, fetal risks? If there is a cholestasis in third trimester of pregnancy. The mother can develop vitamin K deficiency, increased risk of postpartum hemorrhage is there. Breast fetus. It can lead to intrauterine fetal death, preterm labor, interpartum distress, meconium stain like it. And the risk of stillbirth is greatest after 37 weeks is what you need to remember. After 37 weeks. So, how do you manage obstetric cholestasis? Counseling, fetal surveillance, maternal monitoring, maternal vitamin K supplementation. Pruritis is symptomatically treated and you give urso deoxycholic acid is what you need to remember. This is very important doctor. So I will try to uh, change the banner yeah urso deoxycholic acid this is a favorite question of the examiner urso deoxycholic acid is used in the obstetric cholestasis postnatally how do you manage you need to monitor 
until biochemical dissolution, all electric should become normal. Now comes the favorite MCQ. Will the offsetic cholestasis of my last pregnancy, will it come in this pregnancy, doctor? Patient will ask you. 50% recurrence is there. That is the big challenge. I said, I have seen a good number of patients who said, Ammo, nakko, aure delivery, nakko, baba. Last delivery, me pura. Kujli, 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 maria. Kujli, next delivery, nahi chahiye, doctor saab, chubekti me karao. Bolne wale, bahot loog bete. So, recurrence and fetal pregnancy is 50%. And women also is counseled, if you had obstetric cholestasis history, don't take OCPs because your system is such that thoda estrogen, progesterone, badge hai to aapko cholestasis aayega. That's what you should tell. The next favorite topic of the exam is acute fatty liver of pregnancy. One in 10,000 pregnancy, rare complication, maternal obesity. Male fetus, three times more common. Agar ladke ko paida kiye to, three times great risk the mother will end up in acute fatty liver. Multiple pregnancies, twins. And there is a lot of overlap with HELLP syndrome. And in fact, acute fatty liver of pregnancy is considered to be a variant of eclampsia. I mean pre-eclampsia is what you need to remember. So how does acute fatty liver of pregnancy present? There is nausea, anorexia, malaise after 30 weeks of term. After 30 weeks. This is the favorite MCQ. Liklo. After 200 pages notebook mein liklo. After 30 weeks. Acute fatty liver of pregnancy. John is within two weeks of onset of symptoms, ascites, severe vomiting, abdominal pain, and signs and symptoms of liver failure, like hepatic encephalopathy, DIC, renal failure, hypertension, proteinuria in 50% of cases, extreme polydipsia, also called pseudo diabetes, in acute fatty liver of pregnancy, is what you need to remember. So AFLP will lead to raised transaminases, alkaline phosphatase, hypoglycemia, hyperuricemia. The blood film will be leukemoid. And the gold standard for diagnosis of AFLP. This is an MCQ. Liver biopsy. Ultrasound, CT, MRA, they all show evidence of fat infiltration. And for the mother, what is the risk? If there is AFLP, AFLP will lead to fulminant hepatic failure, hepatic encephalopathy, coagulopathy, death. They are the maternal risks. And what are the fetal risks? Intrauterine fetal death with perinatal mortality is 15 to 65 percent. There can be transient derangement of LFTs and hypoglycemia. They are the neonatal risks with AFLP is what you need to remember. So, how do you want to manage acute fulminant hepatic failure patient? Sukanya is before you. How do you want to manage? This is state head. Monitor the fetus. Urgent delivery. Urgent delivery. It's an indication. Admit to intensive care. Vaginal delivery probably is better. Parenterally give glucose, neomycin, lactulose, just like you treat a alcoholic liver disease patient. Multivitamin supplementation. And if fulminant hepatic failure is there, AFLP becomes an indication for liver transplant. Uttana serious problem hai. Postnatally, abnormal LFTs will persist beyond the six weeks, if at all they persist. Maybe your AFLP diagnosis was wrong. You need to look for other pathologies. So what is the chance of that? Last pregnancy may AFLP hua, my fiber fiber toria, garbadoria, pura, abhikya, chance hai. 20% in subsequent pregnancies. Whereas intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, kitra hai? 50% of recurrence. Please don't forget. And if at all a woman with AFLP want to avoid pregnancy, if she takes OC pills, you should 
closely monitor LFTs. The next important cause of jaundice is hyperemesis gravidarum. Four to five points you should remember. To call hyperemesis gravidarum, weight loss approximately three kilos. 0.5 to 1 percent of pregnancy, ultia, 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 ultia. Because of that, the person is dehydrated, hematocrit is elevated, WBC count elevated, hyperatremia, hypokalemia, hypochloremic, metabolic, alkalosis, etc. And serum urea is low. Elevated urea to creatinine ratio. That means there's a significant prerenal failure because of the dehydration. LFTs are a marker of severity. And there can be biochemical thyrotoxicosis and ketonuria. And you need to do pelvic scan to check whether there is a viable singleton pregnancy or not. So the list of investigations in hyperemesis. So hyperemesis, continuous vomiting, vomiting, vomiting. What are the complications? Anemia, peripheral neuropathy, Wernicke encephalopathy. Retching will lead to malaria, tear, catabolic state, hyperatremia, they are all the mental risks. But hyperemesis gravidarum per se does not lead to any congenital anomalies. There will be a low birth weight and uh, there is a risk of fetal death. So how do you manage? Rehydrate, use normal saline or heartburn. Regularly look for ketonuria. Give antibiotics, ondensetron, intravenous hydro, cortisone is indicated if the hyperemesis is very severe. A steroid jo hota na, sab kaam ke liye kaam aega steroid. So what is the new theory about COVID? The British clinicians found that if you give dexamethasone, the COVID patients on ventilator, there is almost 30% of decreased mortality. See, old is cold. And you need to give vitamin supplements. Elevation of the head bed, bland meals, alginates, hysteroreceptor antagonists, psychological support, very intractable cases, hyperemesis gravidarum become an indication for termination of pregnancy is what you need to remember. So what is H-E-L-L-P syndrome? H for hemolysis, CL elevated liver functions and low platelet count. 0.5 to 0.9% incidence. 10 to 20% if there is a severe preeclampsia. And they present with malice, epicastric pain, nausea, vomiting, headache. So what are the diagnostic criteria for H-E-L-L-P syndrome? Abnormal peripheral sphere, increase in total bilirubin, more than 1.5. Fall in hemoglobin unrelated to any blood loss because of the internal hemolysis. Elevated liver enzymes with LDH more than 600 international units per liter and thrombocytopenia. They are the diagnostic criteria of H-E-L-L-P. So how do you manage? Stabilize, manage the especially coagulation dysfunction, fluid management, hypertension, prevention of seizures, plated transition, fetal well-being monitoring, and you need to decide if the woman goes into the HLP that you need to do the delivery. HLP is associated with the proprio DIC, retinal detachment, acute renal failure, pulmonary edema. And the mother can go into critically ill state or even die because of the liver rupture and the hemorrhage. Hemorrhage in the liver is what you need to remember. So, viral hepatitis. If the doctor asks you, commonest cause, commonest cause for hepatic dysfunction in pregnancy. Don't say acute fatty liver, don't say intrahepatic cholestasis, don't say hyperemesis, don't say HLLP. But what will you say? Viral hepatitis is the most common cause. 8.8% in first, 19.4% in second, 18.6% in third trimester. Hepatitis A, 
the management prognosis whether pregnant or non pregnant women with hepatitis a is same then asymptomatic women in the third trimester in contact with the index case suppose if already there is a kid who had hepatitis a then they need to be given immunoglobulin hepatitis b 90% will get a complete resolution within 6 months remaining 10% become chronic carriers and hepatitis b uh vertical transmission is the predominant route of transmission so that is all the story doctor so finally three to four points we should summarize before we walk out of this topic obstetric cholestasis can cause the fetal death after 37 weeks and hence delivery is suggested in 36 weeks non immunized pregnant women exposed to hb they should receive active and passive immunization hb has a very high rate of vertical transmission leading to fetal neonatal hepatitis hepatitis a c e rarely are transmitted transmissibly but overall if i ask commonest cause of jaundice in pregnancy cuckoo cuckoo what is your parrot like answer in the tomorrow's exam viral hepatitis not anything else this is the most common mistake done by a lot of students so the treatment of choice of intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy doctor also deoxy cholic acid what is the best marker of intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy of all parameters bile acids how do you treat jaundice in third trimester you wait for a spontaneous labor now the last topic for the today evening thank you all for joining this session tell your friends every day you have 6 pm to 8 pm i try my best to stick to this time but it is becoming like a marriage vow it's very difficult to stick but a little late little early but we will definitely have a session every day i want to see all of you guys and i want to study with all of you guys every day until the day of exam but after this session is over i want to once more tell you you can go back to the online mbbs.com video library there are almost 3000 video lectures both theory mcq based and discussions that we had uh earlier uh so um so you should be quite sure uh that every day mark your time now the time has come where uh, we are all the time has come for us to become serious to preparation so tell your friends also to subscribe to this channel be part of www.incus.live i want to see all of you on this social group and contribute now quickly let us discuss few more points battle door insertion of the placenta what does it mean doc placenta is attached to the margin typically the placenta is attached to the margin the term placental weight to the baby's weight what is the ratio 1 is to 6 maternal side layer of the placenta what do you call it as decidua basalis the uterus post pregnancy becomes a pelvic organ when does it become typically in about 2 weeks which organism lead to puerperal sepsis group a beta hemolytic streptococci should be your answer what is the definition of puerperal pyrexia more than 100 100.4 degrees on two separate occasions so a raised temperature of 38.5 degrees centigrade and a raised pulse 
during the puerperium and what are the causes of puerperal pyrexia puerperal sepsis breast infection very common urinary tract infection thromboembolic disorders the wound infection of a cesarean and non infectious conditions like breast enlargement or there can be infections like malaria meningitis anything you need to treat the underlying cause what is the sequence of lochia lochia rubra lochia serosa lochia alba or sa so you should know everything doctor typically lochia rubra is red lochia serosa is yellow or pale brown lochia alba is pale white rubra mainly has rbc's leukocytes residua mucus and duration is 1 to 4 days lochia serosa 5 to 9 days and lochia alba is 10 to 15 days is what you need to understand any offensive lochia is because of a puerperal sepsis due to e coli scanty serous lochia is because of the severe streptococcal infection and any suppression of the lochia is because of the obstruction in the internal organs any persistent lochia is because of the retained products of conception or because of a secondary postpartum hemorrhage beyond two weeks there is a persistence of the lochia is what you need to remember so thank you everybody and uh, uh we will all meet up tomorrow and uh, enjoy a great preparation day time there is no other happy time we have wonderful time july 15th august 15th september 15th october 15th november 15th december 15th december 30th oh my god lot of time is there almost 265 days is there every sunday don't forget to take a full scale grand test morning 10 to 1 religiously and afternoon 2 to 5 dr burli bhai much will discuss the question paper but you should solve the online test every sunday and monday to saturday every day for a couple of hours let us all study together good night